1912, I came across a most remarkable collection of preciously illuminated manuscripts. For many decades, these volumes had lain buried in chests in which I found them in an ancient castle in southern Europe. While examining the manuscripts with a view to acquisition of at least part of the collection, my attention was especially drawn by one volume. It was such an ugly duckling compared to the other manuscripts, with their rich decorations in gold and colors that my interest was aroused at once. I found that it was written entirely in cipher. Even a necessarily brief examination of the vellum upon which it was written, the calligraphy, the drawings, and the pigments suggested to me as the date of its origin, the latter part of the 13th century. The drawings indicated it was to be an encyclopedic work of natural philosophy. The fact that this was a 13th century manuscript in cipher convinced me that it must be a work of exceptional importance to my knowledge the existence of a manuscript of such an early date written entirely in cipher was unknown so i included it among the manuscripts which i purchased from this collection two problems presented themselves the text must be unraveled and the history of the manuscript must be traced It was not until some time after the manuscript came into my hands that I read the document bearing the date 1665 or 1666, which was attached to the front cover. That document, which is a letter from Johannes Marcus Marquis to Anenesius Kircher, making a gift of the manuscript to him, is of great significance. Is so special about this manuscript that has been called the most mysterious book in the world. First and foremost is we can't read it. The manuscript measures 23 and a half by 16.2 by about 5 centimeters hundreds of vellum pages collected into 18 choirs. The total number of pages is around 240, but the exact number depends on how the manuscript's unusual foldouts are actually counted. The choirs have been numbered from 1 to 20 in various locations, using numerals consistent with the 1400s, and on the top right-hand corner of each right hand or recto page. It's been numbered from 1 to 160, using numerals of a later date. From the various numbering caps in the choirs and pages, it seems likely that in the past the manuscript has at least had 272 pages in 20 different some of which were already missing when Wilfer Voynich acquired the manuscript in 1912. There is strong evidence that many of the book's bifolios were reordered at various points in history, and that the original page number may well have been quite different than what we have today. Professional amateur sleuths I've been trying to crack the cipher on this thing for hundreds of years, and we still haven't solved it. What's more mysterious is the more we study and learn about this book, the more questions and confusions arise. Now, it's tempting to assume that te the text relates to illustrations, but that's not certain. There have been many suggestions about the historical importance of 
the Voynich manuscript, ranging between opposite extremes, including early discoveries and inventions by 13th century friar writer Bacon, written in very complicated code, or maybe it's nonsense, written by a medieval quack to impress his clientele. It could be a hoax perpetrated by Voynich himself, or an ancient hoax perpetrated by someone around the 15th century. Now in 2009, one of the many questions surrounding the manuscript could be resolved. The parchment on the manuscript was radiocarbon dated resulting in a date range of 1404 to 1438, with 95% confidence. And that brings in a lot of questions of its own. There are theories that some of the imagery points to later dates. These results rule out several individuals who had actually been named as authors of the manuscript, like Roger Bacon, the English scientist who actually died in 1292. Even Leonardo da Vinci was credited with at least owning this book at one time, but that can't be true. Voynich came into the world long after this weird manuscript was actually written down. Now, many new translations of parts of the manuscript individual pages or even individual words are proposed each year. The problem is that none of these sufficiently convince enough experts to be accepted. Although its origins remain murky, Voynichese doesn't appear to be complete nonsense. 2014 Brazilian researchers use complex network modeling to show that text displays similar linguistic patterns to that of known languages. Obviously, those researchers still were not able to translate the book. Essays and theories that accompany the manuscript explain what we have learned about the work from alchemical cryptographic, forensic, and historical perspectives, but they don't provide any definitive answers. And the contents are uh, typically classified into six sex sections. Botanical drawings, which include 113 unidentified plant species astronomical and astrological drawings, including what is believed to be astral charts with radiating circles and suns and moons, zodiac symbols, such as fish, a bull, an archer. And there is a whole section of nude females emerging from pipes or chimneys perhaps bathing in the balneological section. Now this section, which sometimes is referred to as the biological section, it contains a myriad of drawings of, of, of many different forms, miniature female nudes, mostly female nudes. I guess there is one male that we can find. Most have swollen abdomen they're immersed or waiting sometimes in fluids that oddly interlace with interconnecting tubes and capsules. An elaborate array of nine cosmological medallions, many drawn across several folds and folios, depicting possible geographic forms, pharmaceutical drugs, of over a hundred different species of potentially medicinal herbs and 
roots portrayed with jars or vessels in red, blue, green. And there's a section of continuous pages of text, which is usually denoted as the recipe section. Star like flowers marking each entry in the margins. Scholars can only speculate about these categories, really, nothing about the book's text or illustrations have actually been deciphered conclusively. And it's really easy to get lost in this voynich rabbit hole when you try to label anything with any type of certainty. So let's talk a little bit about these different sections. Now, conventional name for the first section is the botanical herbal section. And each play, each page displays one, sometimes two different plants and a few paragraphs of text. It's a format typical of European herbals of the time. Some parts of these drawings are larger, cleaner copies of sketches seen in the pharmaceutical section like deeper dives. Now the first section of the book is almost certainly dealing with herbal, but we can't identify the plants, either with actual specimens or with even stylized drawings of contemporary herbals. Only a couple of the plants, including a wild pansy and the maiden hair fern, can be identified with any certainty. Those herbal pictures that match pharmacological sketches appear to be, again, clean, deeper dive copies of those. Except the missing parts were completed with improbable looking details. In fact, many of the plants seem to be composite. The roots of one species have been fastened, grafted to the leaves of another, with flowers from a third. Some believe that one illustration depicting a new world sunflower was present, which would help date the manuscript and open up intriguing possibilities for its origin. However, the resemblance is slight, especially when compared to the original wild species. And since the scale of the drawing is not known, the plant could be many other members of a similar or the same family, which include flowers like daisies or chamomile or other species from all over the world. Not to mention, the presence of sunflowers would throw the entire dating process out the window. Sunflowers weren't introduced through this sort of geographic trade until years later. Sergio Torricello, an expert on ancient herbals, pointed out that the pointage manuscript could be an alchemical herb, which actually had nothing to do with alchemy, but was a bogus herbal with invented pictures that a quack doctor or, or an ethical doctor would carry around just to impress his clients. Apparently, at the time, there was a small cottage industry of such books somewhere in northern Italy. Just at the right time. However, those books are quite different from Voynich Manuscript in style and format. And they were all written in plain language. That's not to say that these forgers may have gone above. Astrological considerations frequently play a prominent role in herb gathering, bloodletting, and other medical procedures. Common during the likely estates of the manuscript. However, apart from the obvious zodiac symbols and one diagram possibly showing a classical planet outlay, no one has been able to interpret the illustrations with known 
astrological traditions, European or otherwise. Now, the astronomical section contains circular diagrams, some of them, suns and moons and stars, that are suggested, suggestive of astronomy or astrology. One series of twelve diagrams actually depicts conventional or more conventional symbols in the zodiac constellations. Two fish for Pisces, a bull for Taurus, a soldier with a bow and arrow for Sagittarius. Each symbol is surrounded by exactly thirty miniature female figures. Most of them are naked each holding a labeled star. The last two pages of this section are considered Aquarius and Capricorn, roughly January and February, and were actually lost. All Aries and Taurus are split into four pair diagrams with 15 stars each. As you can see, some of the diagrams are on the fold-out pages. circular drawing in the astronomical section depicts an irregularly shaped object of four curved arms, which some have thought to be a picture of a galaxy that could only be obtained through a telescope. Again, throwing our timeline out of whack. Other drawings were interpreted as cells through a microscope. And we've even been pointed towards one of our first microscopes, but this would also throw the timeline out of whack. This green and red telescope, taken out of context, does appear to be one of the first microscopes. Looking at the book as a whole, we see that it resembles many other vessels that are shown and illustrated throughout the book. Now, and the resemblance is pretty questionable on close inspection. The central part of the galaxy looks rather like a pool of water. Some of the images are actually, or appear to be, sea urchins. A lot of that relates more with our next section, the biological or balneological section. And balneological means it's the science of therapeutic use of bath, which is common. These dense, continuous texts interspersed with figures mostly showing small, nude women bathing in pools or tubs, connected with elaborate networks of pipes. Some of them are shaped like body organs. Some of the women wear crowns. The basins and tubes in the biological section may seem to indicate a connection to alchemy, which would also be relevant if the book contained instructions on preparation of medical compounds, but alchemical books of the period share a common pictorial language, or are 
processes and materials are represented by specific images eagle, toad, man, and tomb, couple of pets. But standard textual symbols, circles, and cross, etc. None, none of these could be convincingly identified in Voyage. One theory that has been presented is that this is a coded discrete medical direction book for women's health, which would explain some of the palmeological tubes, pools, new sections, more circle diagrams. These are much more obscure. This section also has holdouts. One of them spans six pages. It contains some sort of map or diagram with nine islands connected by causeways. The imagery presented here is also confusing. The largest holdout. We are presented with more riddles, including a castle tucked away. And as we have tried to decipher this book over hundreds of years, the my, most minute details, including the design architecturally of the castle, has come into play. Now, there are a lot of labeled drugs in this section, which is the pharmaceutical section. Isolating plant parts, roots, leaves, and stems, seeds. And again, the green and red vessels, which Contextually resemble apothecary jars. And the text paragraphs are more slight, sparse. As a reminder, although we want to say text goes with these drawings. We can't say it with 100% accuracy because they were clearly done at separately at different times. After the pharmaceutical section, the recipe section, which if this is in fact the correct order of the book, that makes logical sense. But after learning about these words, we jump into what to do with If you want to call these 
press press they go on and on and on one factor in trying to figure out if this is a forgery or not has been the study of handwriting. Now it's expected that at least two, but up to seven different handwriting examples have been pulled from this, meaning up to seven different scribes, all sharing a very similar style. It's expected that this was written quickly without much hesitation. And besides occasional waning of the lines, it's impeccable. There aren't erasures. There or reductions. And if someone created this language just for the sake of forgery, even if it doesn't mean anything, it's a work of art. Now, a big mystery is about where the book was created. The consensus is that it's most likely from northern Italy, but that is by no means definitive. A lot of the fuss has been made out of the granulations that are depicted in the Rosetta map on the castle. As I mentioned, the architecture points towards a certain style. And indeed, this depiction of a castle or fortress in the manuscripts of Rosette hold out shows a certain type of Merlin quite prevalent in northern Italy around the 15th century. But crenulations appear in a lot of different countries in the 15th century, like Russia, Germany, Romania, Turkey. And there's yet another reason you can't rely on the crenulations as an indication of any sort of origin for the coinage. These appear on a map. Maps usually are drawn by people who travel or are worldly. So who could say if the person drawing that particular castle with crenulations was drawing their home or landmark in their travels? It would seem like total common sense, as would hundreds of blonde women sweating in a sauna, pointing at countries that that utilized medicinal or leisurely baths more often. Countries like Finland. There's also a lot of interesting theories surrounding the fashion presented in the book. Researchers have tried to use clothing clues to pinpoint the year of creation, especially prior to 2009 radio carbon dating. There are several crowns shown throughout the book, but still no royalty has been able to be pin pinpointed in that depiction. The headwear that is most often speculated against are the chaperone with the livery button, or the decorative tail that appears behind the head of the chaperone. That also seems to corroborate the carbon dating of 1404 to 1438, since the style of chaperone seems to actually have gone out of fashion around 1480. Because a lot of what we think we know from the text and illustrations is currently very subjective. But 
let's dive deeper into the history of the manuscript itself so we can try to learn anything more solid. Now, the Voynich manuscript first appears in historical record in the late 16th century. It's been stated that Rudolf II of Habsburg, who reigned in Prague from 1576 to 1611, purchased the book for 600 gold ducats, believing that it had been written by a 13th century English scientist, Roger Bacon. Now, Rudolf was known to collect books as well as being perhaps the greatest art collector of his age, so it would make sense that he would be interested in such a piece. After Rudolf passed in 1611, it appears that it was inherited by his confidant, Jacobus Hortriche de Tepanich. Now, he was born as Jacob Hortriche in a poor family raised by Jesuits and eventually became a successful and wealthy chemist and a pharmacist at Rudolf's court. By that time, he used to call himself by his Latinized name, Snappius. According to stories, in 1608, Hortiche cured Rudolf from a grave disease and consequently became a favorite to the emperor. He was subsequently raised to minor nobility and was allowed to call himself de Tibinich. Tibinich wrote his name in the bottom margin of the first folio in the Voynich manuscript using a noble form. So he must have done that after 1608. The signature itself was not immediately seen. Voynich himself actually found that using an unknown chemical to pull it out of the paper. In recent years, several books and manuscripts have found, have been found, that include a more or less similar form of this ex nigris, or his personal inscription. Timotech was associated with Rudolf's court from 1608 to 1611. In older literature about Voynich, the Voynich manuscript, it's usually assumed that the manuscript was sold to Rudolf by John D. and or his associates at Edward Kelly. But the assumption is based entirely on a hypothesis by Voynich himself, which he presented in 1921, and it's not accepted as fact. So we're not sure. If it is actually true, that John Dee and Edward Kelly did possess the book. It may throw another wrench into the story, as they may have forged information to specifically sell the book. Based on a letter written in April 1639, we know that the book was then passed into the hands of Georges Barcius an alchemist from Prague, who referred to the book as a certain riddle of the Sphinx that was uselessly taking up space. When Barsha's heir, Johannes Marcus Marquis, inherited the manuscript, he sent it to an Egyptian hieroglyphics experts. And I'm doing air quote here. <laughs> Athanasius Kierker in Rome for help decoding the text. He wrote such sphinxes as these obeying no one but their master. Marky wrote that in an accompanying letter. Kierker was later found to be more fraud than expert, and it never actually properly deciphered any hieroglyphics. Maybe I should say any, but what he was famous for. The manuscript then disappeared for 250 years, only to resurface when it was purchased by our Polish book dealer, Wilfred Voynich, in 1912. Voynich refused to divulge the manuscript's previous owner, leading many to believe that he had authored the text himself. And Voynich at that point took the manuscript to London in 1912 and later in January of 1915 to the United States. He always called it his cipher manuscript, and occasionally he provided photographic copies of pages to experts in various disciplines. 
the manuscript became famous when in the 1920s. William Romain Newbold proposed a spectacular partial translation of the text. Now, although this proposed solution was eventually disproved by John Manley in 1931, the mysterious cipher snowball had already begun. Wilfred Voynich died in 1930 and the manuscript was left to his widow, Ethel Lillian, who, who was an author in her own right and preferred to go by ELV. She continued to search for answers, sending photostats of pages to experts all around the world. One additional piece of information that ELV didn't divulge was that Wilfred bought the book as part of a lot from the Jesuit College at Frascati near Rome. She attempted to maintain Wilfred's business as well as sell books per his wishes. Unfortunately, Voynich's London Antiquity Shop was closed in 1937 and ELV passed away in 1960, with the manuscript still in her possession. It was then inherited by Voynich's longtime secretary. The book was bought by New York book dealer Hans Krauss, who decided to take Anne Nill as his secretary. H.P. Krauss purchased for the sum of $24,500. He tried to sell it again for $160,000, which is about the same amount that pointed to was unable to find a buyer either. Finally, in 1969, he donated it to the Benecki Rare Book and Manuscript Library of Yale University, which is where it resides today, barely seeing the light of day. Now, there's a lot a mystery spanning back hundreds of years with hundreds of theories. What it is, where does it come from? Who wrote it? I don't know. But that's at least a portion of the story. The Voynich Manuscript. you want to learn about.